afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start out by saying that as an organization, we couldn't be more pleased with how this search process unfolded. And I've said before that we're going to set out to be deliberate, thorough, and I think we are really organized and efficient in how we went about this. And that's why we got where we are today. You know, the committee has been meeting regularly for the last nine weeks with the intent of identifying quality candidates that we felt were right for this organization. The characteristics that we set really early in the process were leader of men, guys with integrity, guys that were secure and open-minded, collaborative in their thinking, of course intelligent, but a really good football acumen as well. You know, I think we were able to identify, you know, some high-quality candidates that possessed these characteristics that we we're looking for. But at the end of the process, unanimously, we all felt that Freddie was the right fit for this organization moving forward. Freddie doesn't need any introductions here, ladies and gentlemen. He's a man that's dedicated his entire life to the game of football. He's been around some exceptional football guys. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And he's a real unifier of men and people. Freddie did an outstanding job the last eight games of this season. He galvanized the offense. He put players in position to make plays. And Freddie has a great vision for this organization moving forward. I'm excited to work alongside of Freddie Kitchens, as I like to say, to awake the sleeping giants. It's my pleasure to introduce the 17th head coach of the Cleveland Browns, Freddie Kitchens. Thank you, John, for all those kind remarks. <laughs> Hopefully everybody agrees with you. <laughs> but uh, I want to first start by thanking, um, you know, Mr. Jimmy and Miss D, JW, uh, the whole Haslam family, John and his, uh, his group, and Paul and his group. Um, you know, I want to thank everyone uh, from Glenville State College to the Cleveland Browns and everywhere in between. Um, you know, I want to thank Woody McCorvey and Sylvester Croom. Gene Stallings for teaching me that the game of football is more than just the X's and O's. I want to thank Rick Trickett for giving me my very first job at Glenville State College. I want to thank my two daughters, Bennett and Camden, for, you know, understanding the nuances of this profession. Time constraints, half the year. And I want to thank uh, one of the most important, the most important person in my life um, with devotion, to me and for my calls and uh, just always understanding me, understanding me, not understanding what I'm saying sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes she'll kick me in the what, you know. So, but anyways, my wife, Ginger, uh, I wouldn't be here without her. Uh, you know, I really like stress to John and, and everybody involved in this search and, and interviewing these coaches, I wanted a thorough search. I really wanted to compete against everybody that wanted this job and that was a legitimate candidate for this job. I wanted it and uh, you know I wanted to go in and state my case per se. But when I went in and stated my case, I wasn't stating anything. I was very proud that everything that I put in my book was my words from my typing. All right, even though my daughters had to show me how to do the PowerPoint, all right? But I'm proud of that because every word I had in there was my words. And then I get in there and I don't use it because I know everything that's in it. So I want everybody to understand that I believe that they made the best decision. And I believe that they believe they made the best decision. In saying that, I find great comfort in knowing that they were together in doing that. And the one thing, you know, there's ups and downs during the course of the season. And there's one thing that has to happen during the course of the season if you want to get back up from being down. And you have to be together, all right? That's not going to change. Within the football team, that's not going to change. And from this day forward, it's never changing, all right? Since 1999, there's been ups and downs with this organization. 
And just like during the season, sometimes there's more ups and sometimes there's more down. And since 1999, I understand and I relish the fact that there's been more downs than up, but that ends today. I, I promise you that. And every decision we make as an organization, and John would uh, agree with this, I'm sure he would, that every decision will be based on one thing and one thing only, and that's winning football games. Let's not fool ourselves. This game is about winning. Everything we do in the organization, from the football side of things, and moving forward with the organization, we're together. If you don't wear brown and orange, you don't matter. All right? This is the only organization that we care anything about is the one that we're at right now, and that's the Cleveland Browns. All right? And it's always going to be about one thing and one thing only, and that's winning football games and putting a good product on the field that plays with effort, enthusiasm, and toughness. So in saying that, uh, you know, I kind of took on the mind, and some of these things I'm using from the interview because I truly believe it. You know, the letter I is a letter. It's not a word. And when it's used as a word, you've got problems. So that's the number one thing that you won't ever hear. All right? It's we, us, our, because we're all going to take ownership in this thing. And you know what? It's going to make it that much more special when we get to the top. All right? Two is one and one is none. And we're going to have a lot of twos. We're all going to be together. Coaching staff, I know John and I are looking forward to working together. John staff, Paul staff. Everybody is going to be together because ultimately, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. Now get there in the same direction. All right, in saying that, I will end with this, that our only goal ever, 7-8-1, and one, it drives me crazy that people are happy with 7-8-1. and one. It drives me literally crazy. And if I was in a different setting, I, my vocabulary would demonstrate that. But, you know, that's not acceptable. Nobody here wants that. We understand that was an improvement, but under no circumstance is that ever going to be acceptable. We only have one goal here, and that's to host the Lombardi Trophy. And everything we do moving forward is going to, if it's going to uh, benefit us moving in that direction, we will make that decision from a coaching staff perspective. There won't be any, uh, everybody's going to be on the same page from a coaching staff perspective. And the relationships that you build in this business have to earn trust and respect. And we're going to always, everything we do within this organization is going to be trust and respect oriented. Because that allows you to understand that you can have tough conversations with that. All right? You can understand that different people have different beliefs. And if you spend time listening instead of just hearing, then sometimes maybe you can learn some things. So... I will close with this. Everything will always center around winning the Super Bowl. I went to the Super Bowl. I lost the Super Bowl. I never want to be in that position again. But every decision I've made since 2008 has been getting in position to do that. And I have been fortunate enough to be surrounded at this day and age, this time, right now, to moving forward in that direction. And that's all. Thank you very much. Questions? Freddie, Tom Withers, Associated Press, congratulations. You'd mentioned to us that no one really knows when they're ready to be a head football coach. What about your background makes you feel that you're ready for this moment right now? Well, I think that's, you know, it's an easy answer. Uh, Benjamin E. Mays had a quote, and I said it in a press conference a couple of months ago. Um, you know, those who start behind in a game of life must run faster to catch up. I've been running fast my whole life. All right, and I think that's going to carry over into this program. I think the program of the football team, the product you put on the field, uh, is the in direct correlation of how the coach is. Okay, and that's the way I've been my whole life. So, am I ready or not? I don't know. I don't know. I can't. Were you ready to be a parent? I mean, but I know this. I know they had confidence enough in me that I would figure it out and I'd get the job done. And I promise you this: I won't let them down. Freddie, uh, with you hiring Todd Munkin to be your offensive coordinator, uh, will you continue to call the plays? I will. Uh, yeah, I will. I told Todd yesterday I didn't want to hire someone and just give them the title of offensive coordinator. I wanted an offensive coordinator that just wasn't going to call plays. And saying that, let me tell you about Todd Munkin. He made a decision based on people. Our decisions here are going to be made on people. 
what type of person that is. What type of person are you going to be surrounded with? And Todd made the decision based on people. He had other opportunities. And he came in and made the decision for what he was going to be surrounded with and the environment that's going to be created, uh, you know, moving forward. Freddie, what do you think will be the biggest challenge for you when much more is thrown on your lap as a head coach? Uh, the biggest challenge? Is that what you're saying? Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I think you have to, you have to compartmentalize. Uh, I look at it as an advantage. You know, everything I'm about as a coach is building relationships. I learned a long time ago uh, that this is a people business. Uh, people tend to forget what it goes on to get you to the field. But between the meeting rooms, the practice field, and then to the, ultimately to the uh, game field, there has to be conversation. And it has to be real life conversation. Because a lot of times, football is not everyone's life all the time. So you better get to know the person, all right? And that will enable you to have tough decisions and tough questions. Uh, which will get that individual or that player better. And I say individual and player because at the end of the day, we're teachers. As coaches, we're teachers. And I'm sure you had a teacher at some point in your life that made you a better person. So I'm invested in people, all right, not just players. John, can you sort of walk us through the process? I'm assuming when the change was first made midseason, Freddie probably wasn't your top candidate. So... When did he emerge as a viable candidate, and did you did you sort of have a feeling this was how it was going to turn out when the season ended, or did he did the interview sort of put you over the top? No, I think what we did is we sat and met on a regular basis for nine weeks. The committee did. I think we wanted to lay out the format, the structure, the planning process, and then go identify certain quality candidates that were going to match up with those. And it was very early on in the process that Freddie was in that initial group as well very early on. But, you know, what was wonderful is that he had his full display of his resume was at work there for eight weeks. So you had to pay attention to that as well. And then you saw how he kind of brought the players together and galvanized the offense. And, and I think we saw that on a week-in and week-out basis. But all along we said we were going to go through a thorough process and, you know, as kind of what Freddie said, he welcomed that because at the end of the day, he was going to prove to everybody, but guess what? I am your guy. And at the end of the day, unanimously, the committee, you know, we went to ownership with the suggestion to have Freddie Kitchens as, as our next head coach, and they embraced it, and we can't thank him enough. Freddie, when you moved to the role of offensive coordinator midseason, what did you change as a coach? And now that you move into this role, what will you change? Uh, the only thing I changed as a coach was it enabled me to speak to the whole group offensively. And the first thing, the first team meeting we talked about was nothing to do with football. I asked them to trust me that I would always do what's best for them. And I, they believed me. And that's what ultimately, I mean, we weren't calling any different plays. We were calling the same plays. I mean, a couple like gimmicks and stuff like that but, that you need. But the base of our offense was the same. Um, I just, you know, you had to ask them to trust you. So when you ask someone to trust you, if you ever uh, disappoint them, you're not going to get the trust back, or not to the extent that it was. Now, once they trust you, they play a little harder. They make, they make a little more effort to know what they're doing. And, um, you know, it kind of just fell into place. Freddie, after, after your heart issue, you know, almost died, were you laying there? Did you ever think about this day when you were laying there in the – hospital bed uh you know no i didn't but whether or not it was an aortic dissection by the way so my kids uh my friends kid me all the time about what it was but uh anyways no i never have i never have set a goal up per se this is not this hasn't been my goal my goal has been to get better every day you know i learned a long time ago sometimes your goal ends up being your master instead of the progress that it takes to get there. And this has never been my goal. You know, once I'm in this position and as a football coach, my goal is to reach the Super Bowl. And that takes a team. And that takes more than just the football team now, too, by the way. Let me tell you, when I meet with uh, Mr. Jimmy and D. Haslam, and JW is usually in there, too, 
You know, the last thing they ask me always, what do you need from us? All right, what can we do to help you? All right, that's great. Everybody's moving in the same direction. So when you talk about goals, our goals are team oriented. I don't, I, and I'm honestly, I'm telling you, I don't, I didn't have a goal to be a head coach. I had the goal to be the best coach that I could be and move in the same direction with a conglomeration of people to get there. Freddie, in the context that uh, things happened very fast for you, uh, would you mind sharing a point of history? That is, go back uh, to uh, a year or so ago when you were deciding to, to come to Cleveland. Uh, who was part of the, that day or a couple of days, and what was running through your mind back then? Um, you know, I had a couple of opportunities to go other places. Um, now, I told you guys about the three running backs and the wishbone earlier, and y'all didn't believe me. So if I tell you this again, uh, hopefully you'll believe me this time. Um, you know, I had those a couple of different opportunities, but truthfully, I mean, I was a Browns fan when I was growing up. I, now, keep in mind, I grew up in Gaston, Alabama. It was Alabama football, all right? But on Sundays, you had to do something other than go to church and eat a lot, all right? So when the, telev when the Cleveland Browns were on television, I was watching the Cleveland Browns. And, um, you know, I just I, I like their uniforms. I mean, I love the helmet. I like the simplicity of the helmet. All right, so hopefully we don't ever change that. But you know, hopefully it's not in the works anytime soon. But <laughs> anyways, I like the – but I went to Alabama. We didn't change helmets at Alabama. So I'm a traditionalist, all right? That's the way I coach. That's not the way I relate to people. You have to evolve as a person and coach. You have to continually evolve. If you don't evolve, you're staying the same. And if you're staying the same, other people are passing you by. So, you know, I had a lot of that went into the fact that, you know, John was here, you know, and you always wondered outside looking in what was going on. And, you know, I don't know. I know though they're committed to winning. He's committed to winning. Paul De Podesta is committed to winning. We've got a lot of people, these people in the back, they're committed to winning. We've got the best support staff I've ever seen anywhere I've been. And everybody is just, when you have a desire to win and everybody's willing to check their ego at the door, to get it done, then you should be successful. And we're going to be successful. Hey, Freddie. Uh, we saw you put your stamp on the offense. So what is your vision for how to mold an entire team? Uh, the same the same thing. I mean, uh, you know, this just enables me to – and I take uh, a little bit of offense to that my stamp on the offense. The offense is whatever they wanted it to be. It wasn't me. I was just the guy directing the, the choir, per se. You know, the, in church, you know, you've got the choir director, but they don't get any credit, and it's the choir that gets the credit in that setting. And here, everybody wants to give me credit. I just get the people going, and they decide what they want it to be. I mean, they're very well, they very easily could have said, we have a, we have a built-in excuse. You know, if we finish three and whatever, 15 or one or whatever it adds up to. I'm not good with math. But if, if we end up with three wins, okay, they had a built-in excuse. Nobody's going to blame them. So they made a decision, and that's what I ask them. And with our coaches, I, this wasn't just me now. We had, a, we had coaches that were vested in this too. And, um, you know, everybody came together, and they made the decision that they wanted to be better than what they were. And that's what happened. It wasn't my stamp. Hey, Freddie, when did you think this was possible? When it, was it when you took over as coordinator? Was it at some point over the last eight games? Was it at the end of the season, maybe when you met with John? Well, uh, you know, honestly, um, you know, I've got a lot of confidence in myself uh, as far as going to – and I've always said in this business, okay, you make decisions right after the season's over selfishly. But once you've made that decision, so I'll give you an example. If you decide to go to uh, Denver or wherever, you're making those decisions for selfish reasons, okay? Uh, after you've made that decision, you're on board as a team, all right? So in saying that, I'm answering your question now, that when I knew it was possible is whenever John told me I was going to interview for the job. I don't, I mean, you, you guys, y'all don't believe me when I'm saying, I don't, I try not to lie too much, all right? Don't tell my wife that, but I try not to lie too much. And, and, and I meant it when I said it, I, I'm one day at a time. Now you have to have a vision for the future. 
so you can you know, eliminate some roadblocks and things along the way. But uh, I'm trying to do the best job I can in this press conference. And then I'm going to leave here, and John's going to leave here, and we're going to go finish up this coaching staff. And we're going to do it the best that we can today. And then we're going to go to sleep. You know, hell, he didn't let me go to sleep in the last three days. But we're going to do. We're going to get some sleep tonight. And we're going to come in in the morning. And we're going to do the same thing until we get this coaching staff. This is the most important time for me as a head coach is the staff that I build, and that's the approach we're taking. Freddie, you mentioned how you didn't get this opportunity to, to lead a larger group of the offense until these eight games. Now you're leading the whole team. Previously in your career, why had you not gotten a coordinator opportunity to lead a larger group? Was it, was it something you weren't showing? Was it something you weren't ready for? Or were you being overlooked for some reason in the league and you would have been ready for that? I'm probably going to offend some people by saying this, but in today's times, all right, with the media and all that stuff you guys are on, all right, if you don't self-promote yourself, sometimes you do get overlooked. I was not, I was always, um, and I'm still going to be, I'm just going to do my job, all right, whatever that job entails, I'm going to do my job to the best of my ability. I was always under the understanding or the assumption that you do your job well enough, you will get recognized. So if you would could have a crystal ball and go back in time, I want you to critique the guys I've coached from Glenville State College to the Cleveland Browns and see how they performed. That's the only way you have to judge a coach. Or you're going off hearsay or what somebody else said. We don't do that, all right? We're going off what they show on tape. We do it as a player, why wouldn't you do it as a coach? So I want you to go back and get back with me in a week or so and evaluate. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, maybe my dialect. I don't know. It could be something as simple as that. Hell, I don't know. But I just know everywhere I've been, the players I've coached, whether they were free agents or first-rounders, they've performed. Hey, John, what was the one thing in the interview process that stood out for you, uh, for Freddie, um, above all the other candidates? His vision for the future of this organization, his belief and trust in the team effort, the ability to be collaborative in your thinking, um, how he galvanized uh, a group of young men and taught the we mindset uh, of a young group and knowing that who he is, he knows many people in the National Football League and where we are today in the Cleveland Browns and how, you know, even the coaching staff would come together and actually, you know, come to Cleveland, Ohio. They understand what's about to happen here under the direction of Freddie Kitchens, and that's all you could ask for. And you can just feel his passion and his depth of knowledge for this game. Um, and then again, his ability to, to call the game of football. I think that's, that's really important. But it's the unification of uh, bringing us all together. Could, could I add to what you asked me a while ago? In saying that, you know, it takes some, uh, I won't use any bad language, Ms. D, now, but it takes some um, guts to do what they did, all right? And I appreciate that. I won't let them down. And all you got to do is sit back and watch, all right? Because I know that I'm not a popular choice. I understand that, and I don't care. And in reality, I meant what I said if you're not wearing brown and orange, all right, occasionally a black, all right, then you've got to block out the noise in this business because the noise is what gets you in trouble because you start making decisions based on things that do not pertain to winning. And I appreciate Mr. D, Miss Haslam, and everybody else that chose this coach for doing that because they didn't care. They were doing what they thought was best for this organization. Sorry. All right. Congratulations, Freddie. Thank Let you. Just know we're with you, winner tie. All right. uh, <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, in the nine weeks of discussions with your committee, how much conversation was about, we want Freddie back. Can we have him back at what he does best? calling the, the game as a coordinator? Uh, were there combinations you considered with that in mind? Was Freddie agreeable to coming back in that role or not? I think the first thing that we wanted to do 
was to identify the organizational traits that we thought that would be beneficial, what the head coach should be, be about. And as we began our discussions, and there were many discussions, it's, it just it came back week after week that Freddie was one of those guys, too, that should be in this conversation uh, as the quality head coach we keep talking about. And, I mean, it was just conversation, but at, the, but at the end of the day, there was never a thought of, you know, let's have this plan or this hand. The only plan that we wanted was the best head coach for this organization moving forward, period. Freddie, I know you said that you take offense to people saying that you put your stamp on the offense, but the difference from the first eight weeks to the second eight weeks is pretty impossible to ignore. The question is, is, you know, some of the trick plays, the fun plays that you were able to pull out of the hat, uh, how are you going forward balance the that type of thing, being aggressive, having fun, versus knowing that you have games on the line, as you talked about, winning being the only thing that really matters? I think um, it's, there's a lot of things there. You're trying to, like, like get more than, than one. But um, so here's what you have to do. You have to form a trust and respect for a coach, okay? You have to form a trust and respect for a staff. Then once you have the trust and respect aspect of things and you create an environment where you are listeners and not you just don't hear people, there's a big difference. You may have a great idea. I mean, you guys gave me the idea about the wishbone, all right? But I listened to you. And then I went back to my office and I started looking. But then you know what I did? I asked the staff what they thought of it. They thought I was crazy, all right? But we sorted through it and understood that, you know, what we were doing was sound, so why not? And I would always say that, I would say this, you know, uh, if we try it and it doesn't work, as long as we don't throw an interception, all right, uh, we're going to have several plays during the course of the year that doesn't work. We're gonna, our base offense is not going to work sometimes. So, you know what, at the end of the day, it didn't matter. We were trying to do what we thought was best. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Uh, fortunately for us, most of them worked. John, is it correct that Freddie will report to you? And if so, how did you arrive at the change in structure in the organization, and how will that help the Browns going forward? You know, Freddie and I are going to work together on a day-in, day-out basis. You know, um, there is a belief of a traditional um, structure model in place, and sometimes I think that's best. But at the end of the day, Freddie and I are going to make, you know, unbelievable amount of decisions together in unison because we are such like-minded in our thinking. I mean, we're going to have daily, weekly conversations with ownership. I mean, that's just a natural thing you do. But at the end of the day, what's best for this organization is the only thing that matters moving forward. And, and that's, you know, why not have two guys being able to collaborate and talk and just, you know, kind of work through things. I mean, it's just healthy discussions to have. Could I add to that? A couple of weeks ago, I said what? Players chase stats, media chases, what? Fill in the blank. All right. There, I mean, this is a collaboration of everything we do. And it's not just that. It may be what's the team meal. All right. There's a lot of things about this job. Let me just tell you this, too. There's a lot of this, things about this job that's going to come up. I had no idea. But I've got a great support staff, and I told them in the interview, I'm not, I'm not telling you I know I've got it all figured out. I didn't, hell, I didn't have it all figured out as an offense coordinator. But I had a supporting cast around me to get the answers. And if I can't get the answers in this building, then we've got problems because we've got experts in all areas. All right. Sometimes as a coach, you're self-centered. All right, and you don't want to ask for help because that admits weakness. I'm, I'm a curious person, and by being curious, you have to have the guts to raise your hand and ask a question. All right, and I will ask questions because it benefits us all. Sorry, Fred, no, Freddie. No, after okay. after you were hired uh, as head coach, did you reach out to anybody, um, maybe in your past, to get some ex to get some uh, expertise on? what it takes to be a head coach in the NFL, and who would you say that your coaching style emulates? And at the end of the season, what will this team look like? 
um, hopefully on a podium. I'll start with the last one. But, um, you know, as I've gone through my career, I've built relationships, okay? So to answer your first question, no, I didn't reach out, but people reached out to me, all right? And I remember the first night, um, actually the night before, that uh, I guess while they were discussing and deciding, uh, Coach Parcells called me and asked me, you know, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me some advice that night. And after he saw that it went in my favor, he called me again. Coach Saban called me the morning I was driving into work. Um, but again, moving forward, if I don't have the answers, which there's going to be some answers I don't have, I've got a great support staff here, all right? And I've got a great phone that works most of the time. So I can figure it out. We didn't, nobody here, who, who helped you when you got into this business? I guarantee you can tell me, all right? Everybody's got people that helped them get to where they are. So when you, I'm not a finished product. Don't think I've made it, all right? You haven't made it. Nobody's made it. Everybody, I told Baker this, I told you guys this, I told him you're never going to be a finished product. I'm never going to be a finished product as a person or as a coach, all right? But I know how to continue to try to get better, and I don't have the resources to do that. We've got time for a couple more. Freddie, you mentioned relationships. What, what helped you connect with Baker so quickly, and then what do you see as the next step for him? Are we connected, or Baker and I? You think, you think we've got a good relationship? Okay. I just checking. I like to ask questions too sometimes. I said I was curious, right? Um, you know, I think your the number one thing would be trust and respect. You earn respect by them knowing you know what to do from a verbal or scheme or whatever. You earn trust by talking, all right, and figuring out who the person is. Like when you tear away all the facade, okay, who is the person? and what makes him tick, all right? Once you get to know the person, again, it enables you to have tough conversations. Those tough conversations are the ones that, and those at, or those butt chewings, those are the ones that get them better, all right? And sometimes they need confidence, but you gotta tear away the facade and see what the kid needs, all right? And then you can get him better. And then the relationship forms. Freddie, you said something. I know I'm not the popular choice. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, all I've heard in reading the uh, internet is, you know, running back coach to head coach, you know, in the course of a year. Well, that's not the case. I've been a quarterback coach more than I've been a running back coach. I've been a tight end coach more than I've been a, a, a quarterback coach. Or actually, it's about equal, I think. I'd have to, you'd have to let me know on that one. Um, but everything I've done is to continue to try to get better. And... Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to be good enough to start this, but again, I will, I will reiterate, I'm not a finished product, and I'm never going to be. I have a Baker question for each of you. Uh, for John, what role did Baker play in the hiring of Freddie Kitchens, if any? And then my question for Freddie is, we see, you know, you and Baker, you know, kidding around, having a great time on the sidelines and at practice and, and doing all those sorts of things. Does your relationship as head coach with Baker have to change, or can you still have uh, that kind of witty banter with him all the time? I'll go first. Okay. Baker's a rookie. He still has a lot to learn in the National Football League, and Freddie's going to get him to that plateau, and along with a lot of other coaches on that staff. I think at the end of the day, when you make selections like this overarching organizationally, let senior management begin the process and continue the process and then give it to ownership, period. The one thing I would say is um, what's so rewarding about getting the job here with the Cleveland Browns, they're not expecting anything different than what they've had. I can be myself, all right? I don't have to put on a show. So that's not gonna change in front of the team. Uh, it kills me some guys that, you know, they, they think they have to be more head coaches or whatever you call it, all right? I won't be that. I will be who I am, all right? What that enables me to do is to form and build those relationships on the defensive side of the ball and with the special teams. And I get to be involved in all the aspects of the game, all right, which I enjoy. Uh, and that's it. I mean, I, you know, I can be myself and, and if my uh, – we're going to have fun. 
the fun's in the winning, and we're going to have fun. So in an algebraic equation, if we're going to have fun and the fun's in the winning, we're going to win, all right? And we're going to have a damn good time doing it. And if it, and I didn't see that happening in the first eight weeks of the season. You guys split the season up in two parts because we weren't winning. We were having fun because we were winning. You know, I guarantee you if we was getting beat 42 to 7, we wouldn't be over there bantering, all right, back and forth. So that's where I sit with that. Yes, I'm going to be the same person. If we're winning, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be miserable if we're losing. And hopefully we're not doing too much of that. I got a question for each of you, John. Uh, it's not a big limb to say that any GM has a list of candidates for any possible opening that may come up. When you got hired, was Freddie on that list? No, he wasn't. But that doesn't mean that he's not a qualified coach. I mean, his. Uh, I mean, you just look at the eight games he did. Kind of caught your attention too, didn't it? Yeah. No. Uh, Freddie. Good job, man. Good job. <laughs> Good job. That's impressive. <laughs> Freddie, to go back to the popular question, I was going to ask the same thing Tony did. Um, you kind of chuckled when we brought up a few games into the coordinator job about being a head coach and said nobody knew who you were a few weeks ago. Don't you think you were popular in Cleveland? Uh, you know, I think I'm popular in Cleveland because we won some games, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, probably. I know I hear from my kids at school that uh, from school that everybody wants that orange dog pound sweatshirt. So, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I may, hell, I may be popular because of the sweatshirt. I don't know. Uh, in talking to some of the players, it also appears you were popular in the locker room. Uh, a lot of the players described you as transparent and even uh, easy to get along with. Do you expect your leadership style to change at all in the head coaching position? No, it won't change at all. Did they say I was easy to get along with when they had a mental error? Yeah, that's code for you know what, right? So, um, you know, this is truly, these are, I think we sometimes forget that these are 22 to in uh, uh, Tom's, uh, <laughs> he's 40. So um, these guys are, are still developing as people too, okay? So uh, sometimes you just got to figure out what drives the person. And, uh, you know, I tend to do that good, I think, you know? And it can't be a failure. You've got to be authentic in everything you do. I know you've got to put on a show in certain areas of uh, – you know, business or whatever. But that's the great thing about the game of football, all right? You can be authentic and you can be successful in doing that. And you don't have to change anything. You don't have to change who you are. Now, perceptionally uh, speaking, uh, you know, I don't have to change who I am here. You know, maybe I had to change if I went and interviewed for another job. Maybe I would have had to change who I was. And that's not going to happen, so I probably won't get the job. But I think I've shown that being myself can work and it has for the last eight weeks uh, again it just wasn't me it was a bunch of people involved uh, that did that I mean hell they brought in Brashad Perriman all right so we made a we made a, a concerted effort to get him the ball so what did he do he took advantage of his opportunities and um, you know so much of it goes more into just one person I kind of get embarrassed when people say that one quick one for each of you, John. You, I'm paraphrasing here, but you said earlier that Freddie's eight games was a pretty good resume for him for this job, and you could probably say the same about Greg. So why wasn't just keeping status quo an option, or why wasn't the best option? And then also for Freddie, just when did you know football was going to be your life and you could make a career out of it? Well, I'll go first. Um, with, with, with regards to Greg, I think Greg is a heck of a coach. And what we were looking for is, you know, the future of the organization moving forward. But, again, the committee began to have healthy discussions on a lot of different types of discussions. But at the end of the day, all we constantly came back on, what is the future good of the organization? And that's, that's what we decided. We thought Freddie was the best possible fit for this organization moving forward. Uh, for me, when I decided that football was going to be my life, um, I was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, selling cars at Magnolia Nissan BMW, uh, making more money than I've ever made. Uh, and I was washing FedEx trucks on the weekend. 
and Alabama would play, uh, this was a couple of years after I finished, uh, would be playing, there was no televisions in the wash bay, so I'd listen to it on the radio. And I'd really like, it almost bring me to tears, you know, listening to it. So I don't know that I ever wanted to coach, but I knew that I never, I couldn't live without the game of football. So that was more the case than anything. Uh, 23, 24. Hey, Freddie, why is uh, Steve Wilkes the right defensive coordinator for your staff? And we know Ryan Lindley's coming back. Are there going to be any other assistants retained? Uh, we're working through the process of that right now. Um, and we should have something uh, for you in the next couple weeks, hopefully less than that. But, uh, you know, we're very thorough and, you know, Thorough seems to be the running message here today, but we're thorough in this. I would rather wait and get it right than hurry and get it wrong. But when I see a guy that has a tremendous football acumen, uh, is very diverse in his ability to to use personnel, uh, then why wait? It's everything I want. So we didn't wait. And I like guys that um, that thrive to be uh, great, and I think Steve does that. I also like guys that thrive to have an environment of learning and thrive to have an environment of listening and being together and being a part of the team. I can't tell you how many staffs I've been on that were was not like that. It was all a bunch of individuals, and individuals are not going to win. I said it earlier, two is one and one is none, and I live by that, all right? The letter I is I, all right? It's not a we. It's not a word. I is not a word. So I like people like that. I like surrounding myself with people like that, and Steve is like that. Hug him.